Uh, this session on the environmental movement brings connections across our three presentations. And as we will learn tonight, rivers bring people together um, across class, race, rural urban lines um, in ways that suggest a powerful future. So I'm Scott McFarland. I'm a national fellow at the Jefferson Scholars Foundation, and I'm finishing my river history dissertation at Columbia University. I organized this conference because I wanted to bring together a lot of people to recognize the potential of river history to bring a wide range of stakeholders to a new environmental movement. One of the things that I did when I sent the invitation to each of our speakers tonight and in the previous weeks was that I insisted that they were a river historian and I preempted any sense of, oh, well, I don't have a PhD in river history. And I think that this is a part of the first step um, of realizing that we all have the tools to use river history, and more importantly, as we've seen in this conference, to collaborate and learn from other people from a wide range of disciplines, careers, perspectives. Um, so at least those of you who have attended all three sessions, can't vouch for the rest of you, you're river historians too. During the heydays of the, let's say the old environmental movement of the middle of the 20th century, rivers played a key role. Residents of many rivers, such as New York's Hudson River, understood how the river had shaped their region's history and identity. They challenged environmentally and aesthetically destructive development on the river precisely because of this history. And the courts affirmed their right to protect history and hence the river. There are a lot of intense debates in the United States today about the uses and representations of history. But one of the things that all sides agree on and part of what makes this contest so heated is the importance of history. So we define our rivers as key sites of history as people once did on rivers such as the Hudson, then we can find common ground. And what we'll see today and what we've learned in the past weeks is that we're not just talking about major rivers like the Hudson or Mississippi rivers as historically important and interesting. We're talking about hundreds of smaller rivers that define people's lives. The other thing that rivers did to fuel the environmental movement in the middle of the 20th century was that they bombarded citizen census and led them to take political action. Many rivers repeatedly caught on fire, causing property damage and making front page news across the nation. And they also stank. The Maine, Maine's Androscoggin River smelled so bad that people walking across the bridge would throw up. And even more dramatically, they would go into ice cream stores and order ice cream and then leave without eating it because they were so nauseous from the river. Today, climate change has made rivers behave with great variability River residents have experienced greater floods and worse droughts, often with no water in the channel. My hope is that, river, is that river history and history itself can repeat itself. Thus, just as burning and stinking rivers prompted citizens to pass major legislation with regulatory teeth and substantial funding, then perhaps today's erratic rivers can contribute to similar landmark legislation. So I'm not telling you to vote tomorrow, the river is. Thank you to the Jefferson Scholars Foundation for sponsoring this conference. Special thanks to Brian Vallow, Ben Skipper, George Carmen, and especially Linda Weinkalt and Kelly Krozak for supporting all the logistics of running this event. The success of this conference from the huge interest and hundreds of people attending each session from all over the world and great discussions and questions has far exceeded my expectations and I couldn't have done this without your support. So thank you. I'm gonna introduce our speakers and their rivers. We'll hear from each of them, and then we'll have time for discussion and then question and answer period. Fred Tutman is a grassroots community advocate for clean water in Maryland's longest and deepest intrastate waterway and holds the title of Patuxent River Keeper, which is also the name of a nonprofit organization that he founded in 2004. He lives and works on an active farm located near the Patuxent River that has been his family's ancestral home for nearly a century. Prior to river keeping, Fred spent over 25 years working as a media producer and consultant on telecommunications assignments on four continents. In recent years, Fred has taught courses in environmental law and policy at historic St. Mary's College of Maryland and served as a graduate studies advisor at Goddard College in Plainfield, Vermont. Fred is the longest serving waterkeeper in the Chesapeake Bay region, and the only African-American waterkeeper in the nation. Welcome. Dr. Chris Mangiello is Chattahoochee Riverkeepers Water Policy Director. 
He leads Chattahoochee Riverkeepers Water Supply Program to ensure there is enough clean water for communities, environments, and economies that face a changing climate. Chris has written extensively on natural resource topics, including energy, water, agriculture, and wildlife, including a book titled Southern Water, Southern Power, How the Politics of Cheap Energy and Water Scarcity Shaped the Region, published by the University of North Carolina Press. He has published in Environmental History, the Journal of the History of Biology, the Journal of Southern History, and Southern Cultures. Additionally, Chris has written for the Washington Post and other media outlets. Prior to joining the Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, Chris was the Georgia River Network Policy Director for almost five years. Before that, he was a Smithsonian Institution Fellow in the University of Georgia and Georgia Gwinnett College faculty member. Welcome. Janice Ray is an American writer whose subject is often nature. She earned an MFA from the University of Montana and has published five books of nonfiction and a volume of eco-poetry. Her first book, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood is a memoir about growing up on a junkyard in the longleaf pine ecosystem. It was named a New York Times notable book. It's a good book. She was a founding board member of the Otomaha Riverkeeper and wrote Drifting into Darien, a personal and natural history of the Otomaha River. Ray has won a Pushcout Prize, an American Book Award, and two Southern Environmental Law Center Writing Awards, among many others. She lives on an organic farm in the Wiregrass region of Georgia. So I'm gonna just briefly show you the rivers as I do. So here's our first river, the Patuxent River in Maryland, um, close to some of the rivers we learned about in our first session. And then we're gonna go down South Carolina, Georgia to the Savannah River. And then we're gonna hop down just a little bit further to the Altamaha River. All right. so. We go. So, well, thanks, Scott. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm going to do kind of a meandering tour through the folk history of the Patuxent River. First of all, uh, let me say that the Patuxent River, uh, the word Patuxent, I'm told by paleontologists, means water running over smooth stones, or alternately, I've been told it could have meant beautiful woman. That basically the uh, Algonquin speaking Native Americans on this particular river consider those two equivalent ideas. So, if you hear that line in a bar, <laughs> you know, you'll know exactly what they're, what, what they're talking about. So it's a river that has a very particular, let me do my little screen share trick here. It is a river that has a very particular keen history in Maryland. Um, and ironically, quite a fair amount of history also um, that relates to uh, the country generally. So the Patuxent is the longest and deepest river that stays entirely in Maryland. It goes nowhere else but in Maryland. Uh, only 110 miles, linear miles, uh, seven counties. Um, of drainage. It is a river that's sometimes referred to in Maryland as Chesapeake Bay in miniature, but because, because it's a little bit of terrain that you would find virtually anywhere else in the Chesapeake Bay spectrum, but it also is the river that really started the Chesapeake Bay preservation movement. A, a lot of Marylanders have actually forgotten the 40-year history of activism on the Patuxent River, and I'll go into that a little bit. I wanted to give you kind of a, kind of a feel of kind of the atmospherics of this river, and I've become very attuned to this during the pandemic because, because frankly, I'm not I'm not out there much. I'm looking at pictures most of the time, and so um, it has a lot of different uh, landscape and um, kind of feeling on the granular level. I've become fascinated with its with mud flats and roots and things of that sort. That's one of the advantages. Sorry to say, there is at least one advantage of the pandemic. It has slowed my metabolism and my schedule down enough that I can actually pay attention to all these wonders that exist around me. Well, this is one of the wonders that I had begun nurturing in my front hedge that turned out quite not what I expected. I went out each morning hoping to see these uh, eggs actually hatch. And there the circle of life uh, basically took its own, own turn, but uh, not, not to stay on a, on, a, on a downbeat side. It's a pretty fantastic wonderland. And I frankly had no idea, as much as I grew up next to this river uh, most of my lifetime, um, I grew up in the freshwater upriver sections that are very relatively shallow, kind of more stream-like. And in fact, I have uh, friends and acquaintances in the south of the Patuxent where it's deep and wide. Actually, the deepest water in the Chesapeake Bay is actually found in the Patuxent, 190 feet near the Solomon's Bridge. It actually has a sunken World War I submarine on the bottom, considered one of the Mount Everest of dives for free divers in the south of the Patuxent River. There are a lot of different flavors, colors, feels, and, and like I said, the folk history 
on the Patuxent is rather extraordinary. Queen Anne Bridge, the bridge on the right, is actually in walking distance of my home. It was one of 14 various bridges that actually existed at that spot going back to the 1700s. In fact, the little town that I live in was actually created by act of British Parliament before the Revolutionary War. Um, Queen Anne, where I live, was a tobacco port. Uh, British ships, ships of the line, could actually find their way pretty far inland and upstream as far north as where my, um, and my, uh, my home is. That's some 50 miles from the Chesapeake Bay inland. So Queen Anne Bridge is an archeological relic today, but it's also a symbol of a place that has been very, very useful to humans and to civilization for a very, very long time, tobacco and various other commodities that came through, uh, came through uh, my old town. But this one's just for fun. This doesn't look like much, but you've heard of like a Buffalo rolling skates. Well, this is an eagle ice skating down the Patuxent River in front of our office. I have a close up here. He actually found his way onto an ice flow and was literally just kind of ice, ice riding down the Patuxent River. Just as a, as a novelty, I, I thought I would share something you probably haven't seen before because I know I sure haven't. So this guy in the center with the um, American flag in his hat is Senator Bernie Fowler. And um, he was a working waterman in the 1950s. Bernie's 96 years old today. And he is considered the father of Patuxent River activism. Um, very interesting fellow from Waterman. He moved into local county politics, eventually state politics. At one time, he was actually shortlisted as the lieutenant governor candidate for the uh, state of Maryland. But his abiding goal has been, uh, as a legislator, to protect the Patuxent River. And he was the architect of a series of lawsuits going back to the 1970s that culminated in a settlement with the state of Maryland, actually rolling into around 1979, 1980, uh, shortly after the Federal Clean Water Act was um, enacted, the Patuxent and Bernie Fowler and his pals were literally among the first rivers in America to start filing lawsuits under the Federal Clean Water Act to compel the state of Maryland to start cleaning up the Patuxent River. Mostly it was wastewater treatment plants and uh, various other discharges. There are 36 of those incidentally, wastewater treatment plants on this 110 mile river. But the deal is that Bernie, Bernie Fowler, he goes by Bernie, who leads these wade-ins, you know, for those of us who are around during the 60s, a wade-in is uh, sort of like a happening. It's something where people get together, they hold hands, they stride into the river until they can no longer see their toes. So it's a symbolic act, it's a political gesture, but it's also a convening, it's a way of bringing people in the river together uh, in order to experience together what's going on with the river and to check in annually. Now, Bernie lit the fuse. That's what people tell me who are still around, people who are still above ground back when they started filing these lawsuits. But eventually they drew a famous judge, a Watergate fame actually, Judge uh, Sirica, who basically ordered the parties, the state of Maryland and the various county parties into a room in a, literally in a nunnery. I guess the nunnery was the easiest place they could find that wasn't, uh, that had plenty of room for these meetings. Some of the parties actually had to be driven there by state cops because they didn't want to show up because they didn't want to talk about growth management essentially. And out of that workout came the state's only river commission. There's only one in the state of Maryland and it's the Patuxent River Commission. Um, a series of settlement um, agreements that basically endure to this day and yet 40 years after the fact, the river is as messed up as ever, but in the political term that they were in, the governor at that time pledged himself to clean up the Patuxent River and it came substantially back to health. And so the significance of this is a couple of things. It doesn't take multiple lifetimes to clean up a river like the Patuxent. Two, it could be done essentially within the span of one political administration. And three, when the pressure was off, the river went right back to hell and gone again, basically, <laughs> you know, those, 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 those death by multiple cuts uh, took hold. Um, this, by the way, is this year's weight in in um, pandemic mode. Granted, there aren't that many people wearing masks, least of all the two oldest people there, Stanley Hoyer, Congressman Stanley Hoyer, who lives on the Patuxent River, and of course, Bernie, the two oldest guys and most vulnerable guys are the guys not wearing masks. I'll, I'll leave that alone. Um, but at any rate, um, it was pretty much a small and symbolic weight in compared to past years. I've been the river keeper since 2004, and um, I have a very different movement than the Bernie Fowler movement that I've been involved with. Mine is very hands-on, um, very diverse, 
Um, in fact, I would say that if you come to a, a Riverkeeper meeting at Patuxent Riverkeeper, people would be surprised if it wasn't a little bit of everybody there. If you only came expecting to see one demographic, you would be really, really disappointed. But it's also a very litigious movement. I think we actually hold a record. We might actually hold the record for fines, penalties, reparations, and make goods from various polluters over the last uh, 17 years to the tune of $650 million we've taken them down for and plowed it back into the watershed for restoration projects, cleanups, um, and various other ways to try and benefit the waterway. Um, we're small because we do not accept or rely on, um, well, except it was offered, but we're not grant funded. Um, I think we're seen as litigious <laughs> in the Chesapeake Bay spectrum. And so we've really shifted our work to become entirely community-based. So we do a lot of different stuff over this 110 miles in these seven counties. We operate from an old country store on the waterfront of the river where we rent kayaks and convene and do teach-ins and various other things that go on there, jazz concerts. Um, we have a strong fusion with uh, little local uh, Native American tribes, uh, Boy Scouts uh, all over the place, doing the upkeep and maintenance on this place, painting and scraping and maintaining the boats and that sort of stuff. My own history on the river is a little complex as well. I come from tobacco farmers on the river. Actually, the guy on the far left sitting on the wagon, um, the elder guy is my great grandfather, Carter Jones, um, who introduced me to the Patuxent River when I was a boy. Uh, in the middle, my grandmother and my uh, mother and my uh, step-grandfather planting tobacco back in the day when we still did that, and my great-grandmother on the far right, Mary Jones. And again, the river was a fundamental part of our lives. That's where we swam, that's where we took our fish, that's what we used to water our crops. Um, on the farm, in front of my house, is actually what is known in the neighborhood as a hanging tree. It was legendarily, the tree and the farm, in fact, in fact, actually belonged to a county sheriff in my county back at the turn of the century who did basically hangings for extra money. The word was that he could actually pass the hat and raise money at, quote, a good hanging. I've converted this, as you can see, uh, for, for those who uh, speak that jargon, this is what you call an adaptive reuse. We've turned it into a chain hoist to lift John boats. <laughs> it's no longer a tree of suffering. It's actually a, a utilitarian tool on, on the farm at this day. But at any rate, like I was said earlier, I worked in television and radio for 20 some years. Um, I started out as uh, Oprah Winfrey's intern at Channel 13 WJZ back in 1978. Um, it was a different Fred Tuckman, and today it's a very different Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> she never calls, she never writes. But I got to travel quite a bit and see a lot of the world and basically got burnt out on the television thing. Um, you know, as the gear got smaller and I got interested in other things, I became more of a writer, producer, director, until I just kind of got flat on the television gig because I couldn't find an avenue for social activism or environmental activism, for that matter, in that career. And so I went to uh, law school and uh, did a career shift. And nowadays when I meet people on airplanes, I used to work with at CBS, CNN, ABC, CNN, wherever you name it. I, I worked all over the place as a contract freelancer. Um, people act like I died. They see me on the plane and they say, hey, I thought you were dead. What happened to you? What are you doing now? And I tell them I'm the river keeper on the Patuxent and I can see in their eyes, I'm really dead now. If I wasn't dead before, <laughs> I'd become so irrelevant to that other life. And so that's kind of a kick. I find that I've actually, uh, like Jerry Maguire in the movie did, I didn't like my place in the world. And so I changed it. And it's been quite a ride ever since. I treat riverkeeping like I treat blacksmithing. It's hot in that kitchen. You're working with something that's intractable. You're beating on it and trying to form it. it. Takes patience. It takes all kinds of attributes. I only added the other picture, by the way, is to show that I don't have a long, crazy beard like most of my blacksmithing. <laughs> don't quite fit the dress code, <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm an avid metal guy because I do see that as a metaphor for life. So at some point along the way, um, I got the idea that I should take off the blinders and because I was hearing very different stories from people of color communities in my watershed than I was hearing from white communities. And so I decided to really adjust our operation to be much more inclusive and embracing of those other stories. I like to say that as our population on the river increases to close to a million people in the watershed, there are a million stories. And some of them are actually true. <laughs> So, so anyway, I started writing articles and the first one I wrote, um, basically taking off the blinders while green is not the new black, I had two board, me board members quit that night. Um, they, wanted, they thought I was ra racializing or radicalizing the operation. Incidentally, this is a phrase I heard in a meeting about public access that kind of cracked me up because it just kind of horrified me, the idea that if you opened up certain places that were 
kind of sheltered from the public that you would have guys in baggy jeans and gold jewelry. This was the image I got, what was that rappers were going to come down and take over the river and uh, somehow make it, made it, make it less safe. But I guess what I'm saying is that there was a lot of rhetoric and a lot of ideas flowing around this idea of river stewardship that did kind of have race and class and circumstances embedded within it. But the, the tools available to me as a river keeper within the bay spectrum didn't really uh, make it possible for me to play a role in any of those because race was something we couldn't talk about. And so if anything, what's happened in Central Park <laughs> has given license, I think, to our movement to start talking about how race and class really do influence things. These posters on the right, we made up after the uh, Central Park incident uh, with Amy Cooper and um, <laughs> we have them on our website and people, we find them sprouting up around the watershed. We're also active partners in something called Taking Nature Black. It's an annual conference that we partner with uh, Audubon Naturalist Society in Bethesda. Um, and it's themed by and organized by people of color. And these are really exciting, exceptional conferences in terms of the range of stuff people talk about. So I know I'm running out of time. I'll, I'll wind down with a couple of quick anecdotes. So Crab Feast Gone Bad was the time I got socked in the jaw by a housing developer who was angry that we were suing his particular project. And what really hurt was not the sock in the jaw, was his accusation that I was stealing the cheese of the black community, that I was insensitive by filing a lawsuit against a um, basically a bad wetlands permit that was going to disrupt a project that he had an, a financial interest in. What really hurt was that a person of color felt that I didn't have his back, that I had to work harder with communities that had been underserved so that people understood that I was an ally, not just for the environment, but also for a robust and economically healthy community. And, and that really bothered me that this guy would rather beat up on me than actually have a conversation about that. And so I didn't fight back. One, because it was a large event with 500 people. You never saw some people run for the door, but the moment a brawl broke out. But I didn't want to end up in the newspapers as the guy, the riverkeeper who was in a brawl. And so I took the hits because it was, I thought, more, shall I say, more dignified, more, more disciplined. To, to take the heat, because I knew also, I knew my guys would drag him off. I mean, that's exactly what happened. It didn't really hurt me. I saw him a couple of weeks later at a political function. Turned out he was the Democratic Central Chair in my home county. This guy was very credible and very upset with me about his project. He came up to me at this other event, put his arm around me and said, we need to talk. And you can imagine what I said was, you need to get your hand off of me. <laughs> start there. <laughs> let's start Let's start our new revised working relationship without physical contact and work upward from there. Bitter tea, the same sort of thing. Uh, a couple of little old ladies drinking tea explaining to me why Black communities don't just go and clean up that mess. Don't those people have any initiative? Don't those people next to that coal burning power plant, can't they fix those problems by writing to their congressman? Isn't that what we did? I mean, it was, it was troubling for me because I didn't know how to rebut a conversation where these people had such a different idea of how the society works that it, they assumed that their stewardship for the environment was not shared by people of color because we simply didn't take the initiative to clean up our neighborhoods. It was, it was troubling to me. And I call it bitter tea because the tea tasted pretty bitter right about that Venice little tea party I'm at. And last but not least, the watermelon martini. So hecklers, I get a lot in this work. Um, I had a lady freak out in the back of uh, the room at one of my speeches. She started screaming that I was a not really a person of color. I was probably a fake. You're probably married to a white woman. And by the way, I'm sure you don't like watermelon. And so I broke out laughing and said, well, I like watermelon martinis. Does that count? And she kind of ran out of the room with her hair on fire. And I got a letter of apology from it. For the life of me, I can't remember what I was saying at the time that she flipped out. But I guess what I'm saying is this environment stuff, it really does touch people where they live. It touches people at a very visceral level. And so a lot of the work that I do and the Patuxent River Keeper is engaged in is really people-based. It's connecting people. It's bringing them to the river. We work with a paper hand puppet theater down, down south, actually, in North Carolina recently. We did a series of uh, educational videos that we can take online. Um, likewise, uh, we're doing a lot of that work now in our own watershed as well. We partner a lot with Hall River Keeper in North Carolina. But we also partner with other programs to kind of bring life to these programs that we can't really run in person during the uh, during the pandemic. We're a three ring circus of activities on the river stewardship. Uh, we fight PFOS, PFAS, coal waste, the largest coal burning power plant in Maryland is smack dab on our watershed. And we've been suing these guys for breakfast ever since. We actually were successful in getting them to announce the closure of their coal burners um, almost six months from now. 
They announced last June that a, within one year, they're shutting down the coal burners after 17 years of us litigating over their coal waste streams and so forth. So that's the story of the Patuxent. I, I lost track of my time. Hopefully I was within my, my um, allocation there, but I think that's as good a place as any to stop. But it should give you a feel, I think, not only about the work that we do on the river, but the folk history of the Patuxent, which is extraordinary in terms of the people and communities that it touches, uh, the places that it goes, the, the, the problems that we face that I think are probably shared by many um, watersheds. I actually am acquainted with the water keepers that are connected to the other two rivers that are represented here on the call. And, and I know, Chris, in your case, you have a rather stellar water keeper. She's known in our movement as a gray beard, and that would be Sally Valley Bethay, who's a, who's a friend of mine as well. So, um, so there it is. That's the that's a quick tour of the Patuxent River, uh, the Patuxent River story. Great, thanks, Fred. Uh, let me get my thing going here. We all good? See that? Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks to Scott uh, for pulling this program together. It's uh, I'm really pleased to be here um, along with Fred and Janice. And as Fred said, you know, uh, the two of them have been involved in the waterkeeper movement longer than I have. So I'm really pleased to be here um, alongside them. Um, again, I'm, I'm Chris Manganiello. I am Chattahoochee Riverkeeper's Water Policy Director. Chattahoochee Riverkeeper is a nonprofit. Uh, we're based in Atlanta uh, and the only organization dedicated solely to protecting the Chattahoochee River, make sure there's enough enough clean water for the 5 million or so people who depend on it. Um, I am an environmentalist and I work for a living. Uh, a friend a long time ago kind of was joking with me and said, you lobby for Big River. And I said, that's right. Um, and I do it because I need clean water. Uh, my community needs clean water. Um, you know, our nation, uh, our economy, everybody needs clean water and we can't take that for granted. Um, and I, it, you know, I, I work for Chattahoochee Riverkeeper and I'm going to be talking about a different river, a river that I was involved with um, for a lot longer uh, before I started working for Chattahoochee Riverkeeper. But um, what it allows me to do is it kind of also allows me to tell a bit of a history about advocacy for um, uh, rivers in the southeast, uh, specifically for the Savannah River, which I'll be talking about today. Um, Southern environmentalism in some ways might not seem um, like two words that should be connected. Um, and uh, maybe at least not connected, maybe in the sense that, you know, uh, certainly um, when I was kind of involved in uh, academics and um, in graduate school, um, the idea that environmentalism was this thing in the South, that was kind of, you know, nobody wrote about it. And, and so um, unlike places like New York and California, where I think you know, a story of environmentalism makes uh, maybe more sense or, or, or sounds more um, plausible, um, I found Southern environmentalism to be pretty uh, fertile ground actually. And so I want to talk about what I learned about environmentalism in the South, environmentalism in the, in the South. Uh, conservationists, environmental actors, activists writ large that have a long legacy in the South. If you look long enough, if you're willing to be flexible in your terminology, and if you're, wearing, or if you're also willing to check some stereotypes at the door. Um, so speaking of stereotypes, let's start off with one of them. Um, I suspect many folks are familiar with um, James Dickey's novel and then the subsequent movie, uh, Deliverance, Burt Reynolds, dueling banjos, male rape, uh, but do you remember why this group of ex inexperienced white suburban Atlanta paddlers paddled down the fictional Kahulawasi River? And it was all about a dam. There was a power company that was building a dam. It's a screen grab from the movie of an actual dam that was being built um, adjacent to um, where the filming took place in the river. Um, and they, they wanted to be those last folks to paddle. Um, James Dickey himself had been a paddler uh, in Georgia and paddled the rivers. Um, um, and of course, the movie itself was filmed on the real Chattooga River, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about as well. But this movie came out in the 1970s during what was called the Big Dam Era. They were building big dams all over the country at the time. Um, environmentalists were certainly fighting those dams, certainly in places like Colorado. Um, and in this sense, deliverance is not really just kind of Southern literary Gothic. It's, it's also an environmentalist's critique. James Dickey was really responding to more than a century's worth of change uh, to America's rivers. And James Dickey was, to paraphrase the Sierra Club's David Brower, not fighting a dam, he was fighting for a river. In a bird's eye view, if you kind of pull up uh, high into the sky above the Southern Appalachian Mountains and the headwaters, it kind of explains why. From high up in the air, what one can see in every direction is how uh, the Duke Energy Company, George Power Company, Tennessee Valley Authority, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they all fundamentally transform this region. 
And over the course of 130 years, engineers built dams and reservoirs to generate electricity and power, as well as to facilitate navigation and control floods, as well as a bunch of other benefits. But really what they did is they fundamentally created a new waterscape, right? And not just like a landscape with trees and, and streams and whatnot. They fundamentally created a waterscape, flooded valleys all over the region. Um, and in contrast to all those adjacent valleys in um, the uh, Southern Blue Ridge Mountains, the 50 mile Chattooga River flowed wild and free as an anomaly well into the 1970s. And the Chattooga was and is a river surrounded by a sea of reservoirs. So deliverance was an anti-dam rant that matters because dams block free flowing rivers, dams create reservoirs, and in the South, we call those reservoirs lakes. But the truth is there are no natural lakes in the Southeast. Um, let me repeat that. There are no natural lakes in Georgia, um, you know, Virginia, or uh, excuse me, uh, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. Florida is an exception, but there are no natural lakes in the South. People made all of them, they're artificial. So the long story of dams and Southern activism um, explains why the Chattooga River remains flowing free today. And I wanna lay this out with some short tales about fish, a waterfall, some clean water, and come back to that wild river. It's a story about power, control, conflict, and who ultimately would speak for the waters of the Savannah River. So looking at this map right here, just orient you real quick. Um, the uh, Chattooga River uh, starts up here in North Carolina, um, Horse Pasture River um, uh, over in um, uh, North Carolina as well. They, they, these two rivers flow into Georgia and South Carolina. They flow into this large reservoir called Hartwell uh, through that big dam into another reservoir and through Richard B. Russell Dam uh, down through the Strom and Thurman uh, Lake and Dam to a couple more dams down here in Augusta. And then the river slowly kind of wanders and meanders uh, the rest of the Savannah River all the way down to the city um, of Savannah and into the um, Atlantic Ocean. Um, so it's important just to realize that, you know, that water flows through over 16 dams built between the year 1847 and 1943. And then that water finally hits the salt water. Um, so let's start with the fish. Long before the first Earth Day in 1970, uh, Georgians and South Carolinians were fighting dams, and the first one involves fish. In the early 1800s, migratory fish would swim over 380 miles from the Atlantic Ocean all the way up to the mountains in Northeast Georgia, up near Tallulah Falls to spawn. Well into the 1830s, uh, Native Americans, European colonists, and African slaves all scrambled to capitalize on the seasonal runs of shadfish in the Savannah River. They gathered to eat or collect this protein source uh, and so that others could eat as well. Um, then everything would begin to change uh, in the decades before the Civil War. Grist mills, lumber mills, not unlike what you see pictured here. Um, these, these mills were you know, all over um, uh, you know, the um, headwaters of, uh, and small streams um, uh, throughout the Southeast. Um, you know, the, the mill owners would build a dam across the river, send the water into that kind of long finger looking chute. And of course, the water would fall on the wheel, spin the wheel, and then the wheel would spin, you know, stones to grind corn or, or saws to cut wood. Um, but to harness this power, they had to build that dam. Uh, and those structures, those dams would render the seasonal passage of um, and migration of the shad nearly impossible. Um, so uh, legislators, uh, again, you know, you know, before the, uh, uh, you know, in the early 1800s, you know, they would, they were you know, often had to answer to their voters, uh, just as our, we'd like our legislators to answer to voters today. And so folks in South Carolina and Georgia um, worked with legislators, those legislators, you know, passed laws threatening mill dam owners who blocked the Savannah River and its tributaries uh, with jail time and fines. Um, legislators passed all sorts of bills and forged compromises between anglers and uh, mill owners. Um, but the reality of the situation is that those laws were hardly ever enforced. Um, and then they were very, you know, legislators didn't always follow through um, either. So in at least one situation, some anglers tried to take uh, matters into their own hands. Um, in a South Carolina example, a um, handful of folks tried to rip a dam down by uh, with their um, own bare hands and pickaxes. Um, didn't quite pan out the way they wanted to. Um, but nonetheless, it just kind of illustrates that, you know, folks cared about their fish, cared about their food source and, and kind of where their food came from um, and did what they thought they, um, they needed to do to remove that dam. Uh, despite legislative action though, um, 
and what were called the fish sluice statutes. Uh, the losers ultimately ended up being the fish and some of those folks that were dependent upon the fish protein. As more dams would rise throughout the Southeast and the Savannah River Valley, the shad runs would ultimately decline. And by the 1850s, those massive runs of shad were disappearing from the Savannah River and uh, all Southern waters as well. The next tale here uh, is about a waterfall. Uh, in 1910, when George Power, uh, water, the Georgia Power Company announced their plans to uh, dam the Tallulah River to generate hydroelectricity. Not everybody was happy about that. Opponents in the early 1900s didn't like the idea of a dam that would harness, quote, the falls to turn Atlanta's wheels with electricity 90 miles away. The Tallulah Falls, uh, pictured here in this, in this painting, um, had been a tourist destination um, since uh, you know, before the American Civil War. And the Tulula River, not unlike the Chattooga, is high up in the um, headwaters of the Savannah River Valley. It's got thundering high falls, uh, multiple drops, uh, 1,000 feet deep gorge, all unique to the region, of course. And as early as the 1880s, you know, developers thought the Tulula Falls might make a really good um, power source, an energy source. So they thought, started talking about damming it. But of course, there were others in the area who were more like the scenic, scenic preservationists who were enthralled with the valleys and the falls beauty. So Tula Falls kind of had this dual identity of potentially something as you know, wondrous for scenic beauty, but also something uh, important for industrial utility. Um, in step in 1911, uh, this woman pictured here, uh, Helen Dorch Longstreet, she took up the fight to save the falls. Longstreet wanted to save these beautiful falls from the quote, soulless water power trust and to preserve the falls magnificent scenic beauty. So we campaign, uh, lobby the state legislature um, and push a legal suit all the way to the Georgia Supreme Court. Uh, but despite pulling all the levers of, of power that she could over a few years, Longstreet's crusade to save beauty would come to an end. And by 1915, uh, the Georgia Power Company would eliminate those falls with a new hydroelectric power dam to generate electricity, mostly for Atlanta, as I mentioned, 90 miles away, um, as streetcars were becoming popular. Uh, and so over the next 50 years, uh, this dam and dozens that would follow to generate electricity and control floods uh, and facilitate navigation would all begin rising uh, much further down the Savannah River Valley. Clean water. So further downstream and forward into time as well, uh, we're moving more in the 1960s now. I found an interesting debate among uh, environmentalists, I think as we kind of understand uh, environmentalists as well as what uh, countryside conservationists, these a lot of folks that lived in rural communities um, who um, had their own kind of definition of, of what it meant to uh, protect nature and to speak for, um, uh, for the Savannah River. But collectively, environmentalists and the countryside conservationists, they, uh, their, their target was the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, the Corps of Engineers was building the third and last major federal dam in the middle region of the Savannah River Valley, now known as Richard B. Russell. And this debate uh, was all about clean water. These countryside conservationists and environmentalists were repeatedly using water quality to justify their respective positions. Both groups had an appetite for economic development, but not at the expense of clean water in these massive new federal reservoirs that were supposed to provide all sorts of um, benefits, including driving a, a growing recreation-based economy. The environmentalists rejected the dam in favor of ecological health, right? In the 1960s, 1970s, kind of this concept of ecology was uh, kind of you know, becoming a big part of, of the um, uh, kind of you know, pushing back against dams and other um, environmental projects. But they, uh, they rejected the dam uh, in favor of ecological health, free flowing river and the national recreation area, not unlike one found on the Chattahoochee River today, which was founded in 1978. The countryside conservationists, they kind of took a slightly different turn and they, to some degree, they, they were promoting the dam. Um, at the time for them, the alternative to the dam was a new paper mill on the banks of the Savannah River. And these types of paper and pulp, mill, pulp mills were notorious for generating industrial pollution um, and, you know, and uh, producing um, you know, um, fish kills. Um, and, and, and the folks um, you know, in, in Georgia and South Carolina were, were very aware of this. So they cited the potential for industrial pollution uh, in the river as the single most important reason actually to support the dam. They figured, you know, if we build this dam, they'll flood it out, they won't be able to um, build a, a, a paper and pulp mill, and so we won't have to deal with the pollution. Um, and they, they also fundamentally rejected a, a refrain that was heard from the Chambers of Commerce at the time, which was, do you want catfish or do you want industry? Um, and for them, our, I know it was really, it was, that was a bit of a false choice. 
So in the Southern countryside, communities considered access to the Savannah River uh, and the new uh, reservoirs, the clean water that they produced as a critical component to their growing economies and their communities. So whereas the countryside conservationists were concerned about clean water kind of ultimately helped build this dam, uh, the environmentalists had opposed it for a free flowing river. Uh, it's safe to say that the clean water advocates, regardless of which one we're talking about, uh, were gaining considerable powers in the 1960s. Uh, and by 1972, of course, the landmark Clean Water Act was passed. All right, one more little story here about a wild river. So the first story was about Southern activism and about people advocating for fish. And the second one was about advocating for beautiful waterfalls. And the third was advocating for clean water. This last story about the Chattooga River, James Dickey's famous Deliverance River, brings the Southeast's nearly century long uh, water and power history full circle. This one was really all about the fish. It was all about the beauty. It was all about the clean water. And the Chattooga, like I said, was unlike virtually all other Southern rivers uh, within a 50 mile radius, it had no dam on it uh, as were found in other valleys. So in 1974, the Chattooga River was not saved exclusively by crusading preservationists or wilderness advocates. It, this was not a wilderness battle. Uh, instead, nearly every party that was involved uh, in making the case for a federally designated and congressionally protected wild scenic river you know, the federal agencies, the state agencies, new environmental groups that were emerging in the region, um, and also many of the local residents, they all agreed that Congress should confer wild and scenic status on the river. Of course, the, project, the process was made much easier when um, the traditional enemy, one of the power companies, Georgia Power in this case, they owned a lot of the property uh, uh, within this uh, proposed river corridor. Uh, and they uh, kind of, uh, with the Forest Service, negotiated a land transfer um, to, to make uh, uh, kind of the, the river corridor, the wild and scenic river corridor possible. Of course, it didn't hurt that this guy in the canoe, Governor, um, Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter, uh, also loved to paddle states rivers, had been paddling the rivers um, for years uh, and seen here uh, on the Chattooga descending in 1974, just before it became a wild and scenic river. And he would use his power as governor to kind of push the river over the finish line, if you will, in 1974. It is important to recognize that not everybody was on board with the Wild and Scenic River. Um, a few years after it became an official designation uh, in place, you know, thousands of acres of forest uh, burned um, kind of in the area in the region. And the arson was really ultimately a consequence of turning a place that had been really this kind of uh, spot for local recreation into a national destination. The Chattooga had always offered uh, local folks some recreation options, right? They, were, they knew where their honey holes were to go fishing. But those old river users would eventually feel powerless uh, and they resented the crush of visitors that were stimulated by Hollywood's visual representation of the Chattooga's wild landscape and rapids in the movie. One of the fascinating things that I, in, in kind of you know, this larger research project I worked on as a, as a graduate student and, and you know, wrote a book about um, was that there's always more to a dam story. Um, and that's what I discovered about water and power in, in the Savannah River Valley. Water and power intersected with just about everything, water rights, property rights, states rights, and civil rights. For example, uh, when the federal government began building reservoirs in the Savannah River Valley, they would often include plans for recreation areas. And in the 1940s and 1950s, that meant they had to deal with the thorny task of planning for segregated recreation. So the image on the left here is a proposed park in Georgia for black visitors uh, to what is now uh, J. Strom Thurmond Lake. And by the time they kind of really built this, uh, this reservoir out, um, we had, from a legal perspective, moved into the kind of the era of desegregation um, by law. Um, and so they never actually built these segregated facilities um, on the Savannah River. But nonetheless, um, there was a lot of uh, interesting kind of history about recreation um, that came out of this project for me. Um, the um, other thing about new dams and reservoirs is they require people to move. And on the right, you can see a structure turned on its side. Um, it's, a, it's a house on its side in Burton, Georgia, uh, where Georgia Power built one of their last hydroelectric dams um, to build, uh, to create Lake Burton. Sometimes land that folks had to leave was actually the most productive uh, land around. Um, so think about those kind of real fertile river bottoms. Um, but you know, so many folks, uh, some would move without a fight, many would also uh, actually fight land combination. Um, but you know, in the Savannah River Valley alone, um, from you know, the number that I can put a pin on, it's you know, in the thousands um, of, in terms of the number of people that had to be relocated 
and vacated for uh, land that now sits underwater. As I wrap up here, um, I just do also want to explain one more thing about water and power. Um, and I thought a lot and wrote a lot about Southern environmental advocacy ultimately to empower today's advocates. Um, I wanted advocates to appreciate that they were part of a longer legacy of advocates. Again, kind of thinking about that long history of, um, of Southern activism and, um, and that you know it, it's there, it's real. Um, and also to see that the past is, is never, it's never always about winning and losing. I, I mean, I think a lot of the examples I use are not really exactly folks winning when it comes to nature. Uh, but I did want my contemporaries to see that uh, where our predecessors failed and, and where they succeeded and ultimately why. Um, and I also wrote about the legacy of Southern environmental advocacy because of a question that's become more relevant. Uh, you know, why is the South when compared to other regions underfunded when it comes to environmental advocacy? And if it's because, you know, people from outside the South think we don't care about um, nature enough to fight for it, I hope that some of the work that I've done helps folks see a long history that actually tells just the opposite. And from my perspective, um, you know, we're really no different than any other region. Uh, we've been just as successful. Um, and certainly in my experience, uh, we've been successful on our shoestring. So thank you very much. Okay, you ready for me? Um, my name is Janice Ray. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about a river that's a little bit south of the one Chris was talking about. Wait, let me go back. Thank you all for being here on this election eve, a very important night. And I'm really honored to spend it with my colleagues, Chris and Fred, and also with everybody who's here with us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for caring about rivers and thank you for caring about our planet. Especially thank you to advocates in the audience who just labor daily on behalf of, of um, the things we hold most precious and the things we need most desperately. Thank you. Uh, I live in the coastal plains of southern Georgia, a place that was once covered by the Pleistocene Ocean you see here. Uh, my river, uh, the river I'm speaking of tonight is the Altima Hall. It drains, as you can see, a quarter of Georgia and it, um, it come, the watershed goes all the way up to Atlanta and it's mainly formed from the conf, at the confluence of two rivers, the Oconee and the Okmulgee. They come together at a place called the Forks um, and then the river travels 137 miles down to the, to the Atlantic Ocean um, coming out at Darien in a, in a braided mouth system the Altima Hall Sound. Um, here is a picture of the river from the air. It's a, it's a very large river. It may be hard to tell here, but uh, the, the gallons per minute is 100,000, of course, depending on where we are. There's a big cycle of flooding and drought. In some places along this river, the floodplain is five miles wide and even wider. Um, there is a third river that forms the Altima Hall and that's the Ohupi. So um, this is the Ohupi coming in a little bit south of the confluence, you know, maybe 50 miles. And I live in basically in the lower left-hand corner of this picture. Um, I live in the delta of these two rivers um, on an old farm. From the ground, ground truthing this, here's what it looks like, a little grainy, but you see those cut banks over there and then sand, lots of sandbars. So it's doing that, it's, it's an alluvial river that's black water from tannins, from cypress and oaks and pine straw. And it's doing that whole oxbow thing where it loops and loops until it finally cuts off pieces of, of itself. Um, Along the sandbars, which you see on the, in the far background to the right, are mostly black willows. And then the forests um, above those are uh, uh, mainly, you know, wetland forests, red maple, cypress, tupelo, uh, swamp chestnut oak, that sort of thing. I wanted to just briefly talk about human history. Um, these are Okmulgee mounds on the Okmulgee River in Macon, Georgia. Akiva, they were mound builders and that's one of the mounds. 
And I took this photograph last winter during an extreme flood. The river was running red with red clay. Um, silt, of course, a major pollutant. But this proves that we have had human habitation on the Altima Hall or nearby it for 17,000 years. Um, the Altima Hall was pretty much the dividing line between uh, colonization and native territory. In fact, when the when the steamship captains were coming up or down the river, they would they would they their calls were bow engine or bow white, um, you know, telling each other how to steer and where to go. And and then you know, in 1818, um, uh, the there was a treaty signed that then sent um, Native Americans to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. And, um, but this is the home. This, this country is the home of the Creek Nation. This picture is an old, old sawmill that was water powered on Slaughter Creek. Uh, it was running in the 40s, 50s, and 60s of uh, the <laughs> 1800s. And um, we had a severe drought a couple of years ago. And I was able to finally take this picture of the floor of the sawmill sunk in. Um, the wood from my house actually was milled at this place. I live in a house built in 1850. And then we have a long and beautiful history of enslaved people working on the river, settling on the river, uh, pleasuring in the river. Um, it was enslaved people who built this canal we call Rifle Cut down near Darien, which was meant to cut off a big loop and shorten the trip to the coast for cotton and wood and so forth. Um, I, I want to talk for just a minute and let you look at this picture um, just to rest your eyes on something. I came back to southern Georgia in uh, about 20 years ago. I, I was already 35 or so, 37, and I had a, I was an environmentalist, a hippie, a progressive, and I came back to my homeland for a number of reasons. Um, the foremost of them was that I believe that if all the people who get an education or who care or who, who um, feel something for a place, leave it for a job, a career, it spells doom for that place and for those people. Um, I also I have done a lot of studying about place. I'm a kind of a scholar of place. And I, I feel that I know that my body is made from this place. And, and so when, uh, when the place, when we lose parts of the place, I lose parts of myself. So I came back to honor my history, to honor my people, to honor my ancestors, to honor um, the land. Um, the other reason is because my grandmother's house was empty and I, you know, I, I wanted to ride. I knew I wouldn't make much money. And so I, uh, my Uncle Percy a, and allowed me to come live in my grandmother's old house. I found that most of the stories, you know, it was really interesting listening to Chris because most of the stories of southern Georgia, this place with no big cities, you know, no environmental movement. Um, no Sierra Club, no coffee shops, a place where a, a boyfriend at the time from Savannah said, I have to set my watch back 100 years when I go visit you in Baxley. I felt that somebody needed to tell the stories of these places. There were so many beautiful narratives were untold. And, and so I came home. In December of 1998, I, I saw a notice in the paper that EPD was having a public meeting about um, the Altima Hall. And at that meeting, I met this man, James Holland. Some of you, Fred, you probably know him and I know you do, Chris. James uh, was, uh, he, James got a, James went through the ninth grade. He joined the Marines. 
He was a crabber after the, his military career. He was a crabber for 30 years. He saw his catch just dwindling constantly. He became very concerned and began to talk with other uh, uh, fisher folk and water people. And um, he was at the EPD meeting. Within months of that meeting, we had begun a river keeper. We, you know, we had met, we had filed for nonprofit status and James worked for the river keeper then for the next 10 years. Um, actually, I think I have the date wrong. He worked through 2010. Many, many wonderful things got happen during that time. And when I, you know, as I was putting this together and thinking about the activism that we had, it was, it was, there was something just, we still have, Autumn Hall Riverkeeper is still in operation. Um, things are still moving along, but there was something about that, the, the, the movement that began then, the originality that was just so powerful, so earth shaking. And I wanted to just talk to you for a little bit about James's activism and, and all of our activism, because we, we got enough money to rent an office and, and to hire a director as well as James. So she was running the office and, and um, doing the development. Um, he made it his duty to get out into this huge watershed, which you just saw, and with eyes on the ground. Very important. The second or probably the first foremost important thing that he did was take photographs. He got arrested a couple of times for trespassing. He realized that lots of terrible things could be hidden behind trees and bushes and embankments. And he began to do aerial flights a lot with South Wings and then with others. And the third thing he would do would, would, is what I call not hand-to-hand -hand combat, but hand-to-hand -hand connection. So James began to send these photographs, not only to the regional director of the EPD, but, but also copying 25 of us or 50 of us. I might get a phone call from him at eight on a Sunday morning. You know, like I'm just waiting until uh, everybody wakes up so I can talk to you about this. There was something too, um, like you, Fred, there was something about the power of James's story because James's story was one of transformation. They had come from this place, this place of, of real poverty, of, you know, of, I won't, I won't go into telling his story now, but, it, but there's a lot of sadness in his childhood. And yet he overcame and he overcame to the point of leading the rest of us in, in, into this new way. What happened was that people, my people began to realize that these far off ideas that they might've heard of someplace that they might've seen on TV actually did apply to them. That, you know, we shouldn't be pushing, uh, you know, our refuse off in the water. We shouldn't be pushing are pulling up, throwing our deer carcasses in the water uh, on, after hunting. Um, we shouldn't be running pipes from our towns out to the water. So I started to title this slide redemption because I think that's what happened. I think that it was a way that the activism of the river keeper led by just, you know, people, just people up and down this very poverty stricken place was that we could be redeemed for some of the things that we had done. James would always say, we're gonna take that river back. It belongs to the people. My major concern is logging. It has always been logging. And I've enlarged these pictures so much that they're grainy, but I want, to, I want you to just see uh, a few pictures, you know, from uh, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood. It, it's about the longleaf pine that I, I really have been so heartbroken that the South is just being whittled down to nothing that that our woodlots are 
are are being used to fuel a globe, really. Um, when I was young, I saw a tree being cut and I felt the trees feelings. It was a very strange thing. And uh, since that time, I've, it's very difficult for me to see trees getting cut. It's very, very difficult for me to live in so much rampant and wasteful and degrading um, logging. What happens when you break off a part of nature is that you also break off a part of its people. You break off a part of culture. This happens with race as well. Um, and it means we're all degraded when we break off any parts of ourselves. I could do an entire um, presentation on this second movement that was happening simultaneously with the Riverkeeper movement. And this was that the Nature Conservancy listed the Altima Hall River Corridor as one of its 75 last great places in the world. Um, they began to uh, preserve land in this thing they called a bioreserve. It started in 69 with some shorebird nesting islands, which are out in the mouth really critical habitat for um, migratory shorebirds. I did not have room on this slide to list the dozens and dozens of acquisitions that the Nature Conservancy made. The most recent one, as far as I've been told, was in December of 2019, a little less than a year ago, that there were two more big pieces added to the corridor, which brought us up to 183,000 acres protected either by outright buying or by conservation easement. So over 50 miles on both sides of the river from the coast inland are saved for perpetuity. I, I wanna just show you a couple of slides uh, that would, you see these white sandbars that's what all of our rivers in the coastal plains look like. They have been stained and, and dyed by pollutants and toxins, but originally they would have looked exactly like that. And this river is the Ohupi here. This place still exists. You see cypress knees taller than this woman's head. Um, for some reason, when the loggers at the turn of the 18th, 19th century were logging Georgia to pieces, this place got saved for whatever reason. It's a, it's a real wonderland. I, I've stuck in here some lovely pictures that James did. To, these are swallowtail kites, are really important. They nest and the tall canopy trees of the watershed. You see kingfisher, an epiphy, an orchid, an osprey, that's a sundew. There's James next to a big, it's funny with climate change, we have more South Florida, South, yeah, Florida, um, shorebirds coming up. We collected James's photographs into a book called The Altima Hall and here the three of us are, Dorinda, James, me. And here we are, um, James actually took this picture. Uh, he was touring, a, a friend was visiting from Kentucky and he was touring us. James has not stopped. He's still flying over mostly the coast and about a week ago, he sent me this picture. What he's doing now is documenting climate change uh, on the coast.
Here's my place. You can friend me, my watershed address. There's a lot more I could say, but I won't. And I thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you all so much. That was a great way to end this, this conference. Um, I love all the connections that you made between each other's presentations and then also from the two earlier sessions that we had. So we're just gonna take um, a little bit of time for you to discuss amongst yourselves, thinking about your presentations and thinking also sort of how we can use River history for environmental justice for the environmental movement. Um, so I'm going to mute myself and uh, hand it back over to you three. Yeah, uh, Janice, you know one, one of the things that you you pointed out um, um, about like what the work James is doing. I mean, you know, I, I think that all three of us probably know that it, if you go looking for something, you're going to find it to a certain degree. And you know, like if you can go out and you can you can sample a bunch of streams and if you if you sample 10 you're going to find something that's wrong i mean it's just it, it and it's not always that people are doing bad stuff um you know intentionally but um sometimes they are and um, sometimes the only way to to find it is to go and look for it yeah so chris i might come back to that but i want to it's so really interesting that you have such a positive look on environmentalism in Georgia and in South Georgia. And it's, it's, you know, it's, I don't, maybe I'm a cup half empty kind of person, but let, let's come back to that because I wanna ask Fred a question and we're all talking about activism. And, and what I'm really curious about Fred, there are two things, but one is what kind of activism do you think has been most effective in your watershed? And is it litigation? So Ottomaha Riverkeeper definitely hit the litigation, you know? And some of the things we didn't change. So for example, with logging, we only have best management practices. We don't have re any real policy in place for logging, like not policy with teeth. And, and so there, there's so many ways that I feel, and I heard you say this, that we haven't made we, it's easy to regress. So I kind of alluded to it. Um, we're, we're not a foundation supported venture because I do believe that corporate financed environmentalism tends to roll very differently, which is not to say that it does bad work. It just does very different work. We could not do the sort of uh, transformative change work within the river culture within the state culture. Remember, we're all entirely in one state. In, in a sense, that ought to be an easier transaction than if we were on a major river that ran through multiple states. But the key here, I think, is that this river has a, a history of citizen outrage <laughs> that has driven the needle towards restoration and protection. And for a short while in time, while the agreement were fresh in their minds, the state pretty much stuck to it. But in order to get that accomplished, they had to give something up. And that something was very, very valuable. It turned out to be exclusivity. There was no Chesapeake Bay movement at the time this occurred. And they couldn't get anything memorialized in the General Assembly because frankly, nobody cared about the Patuxent except the people who lived along it, who had a connection to it, who were involved with it. And so to memorialize the basically the, the legislative side of the agreement they worked out back in the early 80s, the governor, who was Harry Hughes at that time, just passed away not that long ago, a couple of, within the last year and a half or so, he said, let's start a Chesapeake Bay movement. Then everyone will vote for this stuff because everyone will be a beneficiary. So now we're part of the force in the trees problem, right? We have an enormously diffuse, broad movement that's been failing for 40 years to clean much of anything up at all. The one river that was substantially brought back to health has seen all those gains disappear. And it isn't necessarily litigation, as much as I think you have to have litigation in your back pocket to be credible. If you're going to these polluters and saying, we'd love for you to clean it up, but if you wanna give us a grant instead, sure. <laughs> right. right, I think you have to have at least the credibility of having the tool of litigation in your hand and to at least have a conversation with the right parties. Otherwise you'll end up talking to community affairs instead of the boardroom or the chair or the president or someone who can actually change something. 
And I think that's really, really key. We have to change the way these movements are unrolled. They're not really master gardener movements. If you really want to change the fate of this river, as much as that's a really good thing, right? These are really so social change movements, essentially. So last thought on that, in the Bay Movement, the prevailing idea is that these are behavior change movements, not social change movements, which I think alienates anybody who understands the true anti is, you gotta change the system. You're not just gonna fix these problems by changing how people act around these rivers. So it's a circuitous kind of, you know, meandered like my, meanders like my river kind of answer, but I think that's really the key. If you don't have that citizen outrage, that squeaky wheel, not a lot's gonna really happen. You'll get lip service any day of the week. Mm -hmm. It's just my take on it. What do you think? What's your, what's your sense of it? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I've been just pondering this a lot lately um, and worrying about it actually. And maybe, so Fred, maybe, so Chris, would you like, so Chris, you guys are seeing much more progress, I think, with Chattahoochee Riverkeeper and maybe permanent change and maybe being a scientist, you see more ways to quantify, you know, and I just qualify. So, I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe it is happening. Um, yeah, so first of all, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> um, I'm a social, actually, no, I, I'm a social scientist. I'll, 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 I'll earn that. Um, as far as um, you know, what makes this change happen, I think to Fred's point, um, when you rile people up enough about something um, that, yeah, that matters. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot working at the Georgia legislature, you know, lobbying legislators that um, you know, how you talk about things really matters. And, but on top of that is, you know, you know just you know, don't, I, I am not a sensationalist, you know, I, I am very, you know, I'm very concrete about things when I'm talking about them. I'm very factual. And, and I think that, you know, once legislators kind of realize that and you're able to kind of turn that into um, a communications campaign and you get people in the grassroots riled up about stuff, like people start to take you seriously and, and like you have some legitimacy because what you're doing matters. Um, so um, I am having worked in the Georgia General Assembly, I'm, I'm actually generally not a very optimistic person, but um, I will say that uh, we have seen some real and substantive um, changes over the last couple of years. Um, and that's tricky, you know, it's hard working in a relatively conservative, well, not relatively, in a conservative state, uh, but there are a lot of conservatives who care about the environment. And so it, 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 it kind of, it's like everything. It depends on how you want to define success. Um, and, um, and that matters. Can I, I want to interrupt you. So when you're talking to people, maybe talking to funders, do you have some numbers where you say, when we started this many years ago, the water ran with this many? Yeah, yeah. So certainly, um, certainly, you know, Sally Bethay, the founding uh, riverkeeper, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, um, you know, 26 years ago when um, they, you know, when she decided to, uh, you know, with the board, they decided to go after the city of Atlanta and their kind of, you know, really messed up sewage overflow and really bad pollution discharge permits. You know, they took them to court and they won. So, I mean, like, like Fred was saying, um, that was ultimately a successful legal case, which gave the organization some credibility um, and it cleaned up the river, right? We can document since, you know, we can document, you know, certain, you know, as, as these, as the city of Atlanta started to, to, you know, make improvements and changes to their, wastewater system, you know, we saw water quality improve. And so you know, like, we can document that. And I, like, and this is all just really within the last, you know, 12 months, um, in the 19, you know, starting the 1960s, downstream of the city of Atlanta for about, I don't know, let's just say 50 miles, um, 60 miles down to West Point, um, the city of, or excuse me, the state of Georgia would not allow any municipal entity to withdraw water from the river for drinking water purposes. The river is so clean right now, there are three municipalities that are looking at withdrawing water from the river downstream. So from like a change perspective, like that's real, it's documented in 26 years. So look, we don't have to go here, but I wanna just say this. So that's kind of bad news though for the Appalachian. <laughs> yes, 
That's correct. Um, and that is like, so yeah, I, 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 that is a, it is a balancing act that I am like, as we speak, trying to figure out how to think about this in such a way um, that is beneficial for all river users. That's my job. Like, I'm not just working for Georgia. I am not just working for Atlanta. Like, I'm working for the river and the river, like, I got friends downstream. Um, and some of them are in cities. Some of them are farmers. And some of them are down in Apalachicola. Yeah. Where the oyster, where the, you know, the oyster fishery has been closed yep. for, for five years, definitely, possibly forever, you know. Yeah, I hear you, but I also hear what you're saying that downstream is cleaner. I mean, that is, that is, that's stats. Yeah. All right. Sorry to interrupt. I'm going to take the time for us to listen to some questions that we have from the audience. Um, so the first question is for Fred. It's, you are the only African American waterkeeper in the US. And as a general rule, Black Americans are underrepresented in the broader environmental movement. What's your explanation for that? What are the barriers to African Americans becoming involved in the river protection movement? So first of all, let's look at the lens. When we talk about the environmental movement, I think people are usually talking about the paid funded environmental movement. At a grassroots level, I don't see any absence of people of color at all. In fact, those tend to be pretty diverse movements in my experience. I think these larger uh, corporate funded, for the most part, are foundation funded, which is pretty much the same thing, right? The tax advantage front of corporate money is that foundation. These are movements that struggle with top-down control. And I believe it's hard to create integration that way. It has to be organic. It has to be connective and it has to be connected to communities. But community-based work is very hard to fund. I think my other two colleagues would really probably agree with that. Nobody really wants to pay for that stuff, <laughs> except the communities themselves who are the beneficiaries. In my case, I have struggled as an African-American to be my own man in a movement where there are tons of ideas, people eager to tell me exactly where I fit in, you know, tell me how much capacity I have, um, announce that I'm the diversity in the room, which I think is kind of insulting because frankly, diversity is, what's that? <laughs> it's not equality, it's, it's like a special category, you know? I essentially have found that the richest work that I'm doing in terms of all the great stuff that happens at Protection River Keeper tends to be with local grassroots communities. That's where the action is. These upper movements, the upper in the sense that they keep on trying to find ways to tell the grassroots what to do, <laughs> because after all, they're doing their jobs. These are jobs. They're very different stakeholders in the equation. They're not necessarily directly affected by the issue. The issue for them is something that's fungible. Right? They, they can move it wherever they want in the watershed because again, these are jobs. So I think that's the struggle that African-Americans have is being ourselves in these organizations. And I am constantly amazed that people conclude that we're not interested in the environment simply because we haven't embraced the existing leadership or these other movements. The truth is we've gone elsewhere. These are boycotts. I think that's what gets missed. The people will boycott movements where they don't feel important, where they don't feel acknowledged, and where they feel that they can't really make a contribution. They can stand by and watch the majority players do save the planet all by themselves. They get all the money, they get all the funding, they get all the accolades. I mean, that's really the proposition we're presented with. And I think people of color have better ideas about what we can do with our time and where we can spend our time in these organizations. In my case, I tried to create exactly the organization I would have joined if I was in the mood to join an organization. And that took me in some places where the funders were unwilling to go. So in truth, we had to fire at least one funder who wasn't on that train, who believed that you know, race was unimportant and insignificant. Actually, it was fundamental in some of these environmental justice struggles. So we had to confront race and class. So now we have the expectation that people come to a Patuxent Riverkeeper event and it's going to be diverse. They'll be surprised if it's not. I've had to chase white people down the street and say, why are you leaving early? because they weren't in the majority. It's a different paradigm. They're accustomed to being, having movements that are about themselves. And I've had to lure people back in, please come back. We really want your participation. Well, I didn't think I'd be welcome. Why? Because you weren't in the majority. I mean, there's a lot of layers here, but I think that's a part of the experience of being an African-American. The expectations are needlessly low for us. And we have to bring people up short and make them clear. We are active participants in these movements, not just people standing around waiting for someone to diversify us. I've never heard a black or brown community say we need more diversity, never. That's an idea that's born out of, I think, establishment run environmentalism. Sprinkle a little condiment of diversity into these movements so that we can make bigger movements. I mean, I hope that doesn't sound like a rant, but, but that's the 
recounting I also get from the prior African American river keepers. While I'm the only one now, I haven't always been. <laughs> there have been others who have come and gone. They've gone back to the grassroots, the others. Thank you. Next question is, with climate change and environmental justice issues being largely sourced from fossil fuel plants and pipelines, do you envision any form of hydropower helping to provide remedies? And if so, how would you like to see the infrastructure implemented to reduce social and environmental impacts? No, oh, who, who wants to run with that one? Uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of interest in figuring out um, how to maybe repurpose existing structures that um, in a way that, you know, they could potentially generate more hydroelectricity. Um, I mean, certainly there are no shortage of um, engineers who are creative who could find places to build big structures to, um, but I think the reality is, is that um, I, I, during, during, during the period, you're kind of during the big dam era, I think one of the, the, the refrains was, oh, you know, the Colorado River dams, they're just going to silt up and then they're going to turn into waterfalls. And I think the reality is that we're actually looking at these big dams that are going to turn into dry desert riverbeds because, I mean, climate change is not necessarily producing the rainfall when we need it. Um, and certainly in the American West, it's all snowpack based um, and there's less snowpack. So uh, I'm not sure whether or not hydropower is really really reasonable or reliable going forward if there's no precipitation, whether or not it's rainfall or whether or not it's snow. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we should be looking at other, um, um, you know, other um, alternative energies like solar and, um, and wind power. And, and you know, in, in a place like Georgia, where, you know, five, 10 years ago, you know, Georgia Power was saying, oh, we can't do solar. It's not sunny enough here. It's like, there are thousands of acres of solar panels here now. And it's so lucrative that farmers are no longer farming. They're just leasing their land for 30 years because it's, it's more lucrative than putting a crop in the ground, particularly given kind of all the economics of, of agriculture. It's cheaper to sign a lease for solar panels. This question is for Janice. How much of a role does ecotourism play in your conservation efforts? Is this sort of thing promoted in the region? My understanding being that birding is phenomenal along the river. Well, thank you for the question. That's something I, I, I used to promote ecotourism a long time ago, but I don't so much anymore. I mean, I, we'd love to have you come visit us on the river. I mean, there, we don't have really canoe livery services. Um, it's pretty remote where, you know, the, the Ottawa Hall runs through some remote territory. But I will tell you that, um, the reason I've changed is because of the use of fossil fuels to go so many places. Like we've told ourselves that we grow and become better people when, when we experience other cultures and we do. But I think the time has come for us to learn our own places and for us to stay put more. I've been so grateful to um, the pandemic, you know, for all the suffering it's caused. One of, the, one of the great things about it is that we have been doing what we should have been doing for years and years as climate change came you know, barreling toward us. And that is staying put, making sure our own houses are in order, strengthening our families and our communities. So yes, ecotourism is wonderful. And I don't see how it's possible because the time for using fossil fuels for almost anything is past. Thank you. So we're gonna have time for one more question before we wrap up here. Um, and this is what Chris said is true. And this is for everyone. What Chris said is, is true. Lots of conservatives desire better environmental protection, but they will stick by their vote with other issues with environmental issues becoming more and more time sensitive, what do you think will happen? As in, when will it become so bad that people will actually unify to help the environment? And what do you recommend young people do to speak up, stay active to help this? Well, I think the problem with capitalism is that people buy the very best environment they can afford right now. And so they don't necessarily have an appreciation for the have nots, those that have. I think that's a cultural phenomenon <laughs> in our society. Right. Nobody really cared so much about what was happening in Flint with their water, except the people who were there. 
right? I mean, there was a little bit of outside interest, but not nearly enough to budge the real problems there. And there are lots of flints around this country. There are lots of have nots. So I do think we have to have the bandwidth to challenge capitalism, which is something that's very hard to do if you're corporate funded. And I'm not saying, you know, you can't build big organizations sometimes without that. But I guess what I'm saying is that's the paradox that we have to struggle with, right? Are we making a difference or are we making a living? On any given day, I think we have to kind of confront that. And some days are better than others because we're working within a systemic problem that doesn't really incentivize stewardship for other people's water, just the water you have. Sad but true. I would say, you know, what can you do um, to speak up and stay active and is, is to show up, um, get, I mean, I mean, getting the vote out, um, and continuing to engage. Um, I think that when we stop engaging with any issue that's important to us, then, then I mean, and it's, there's so much obviously <laughs> to be engaged with, but um, it's important to stay engaged with something um, that really matters. Um, and as far as, I mean, maybe kind of part of the other question, um, you know, Conservatives are um, are like anybody else when it comes to being, you know, legislators involved in policymaking. You know, they um, they can change, um, and, um, and that goes for anybody. They can change for the better, for the worse. So um, it's just important to keep talking to them and keep encouraging them and to stay engaged. And, and so I'll say the same thing that, you, you know, it, young people are already and get young people are really leading the way in, in this issue of climate destabilization. So just join in, you know, be willing to be willing to hit the streets. Be willing to challenge the dominant paradigms that we've been just told over and over and over, because those paradigms are failing. I agree. Thank you for asking the question. Feel free to challenge me too. I don't have all the answers. Great. Well, thank you to our awesome audience. Thank you to our wonderful speakers. This is a great way to end this series. Um, and as I've said before, riverhistories.org, you can find the recordings for this one and the earlier ones, um, and feel free to, to email me at wsm2116 at columbia.edu, and I can share any feedback you have with me and our speakers, um, and um, good luck to us tomorrow. So. <laughs>